بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأهل بيته التيبين التاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم So the next right of the Muslim over his Muslim brother is being with him at his death. So one of the important rights of the believer is being them, being there for them while they are dying, if you can. When a person is facing death, you know, he's very scared, he is lonely, and he may be unsure about what is waiting for him. So we should visit him, encourage him to seek forgiveness of Allah. We should read the Quran with him, especially Surah Yasin has been recommended to read while a person is on their deathbed. And this visitation of them will ease the pain of loneliness and it will bring that person comfort. We see that Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, he said the reward for eliminating the cause of a Muslim sorrow is more than the reward of praying and fasting, and it is the best way to approach Allah. He says Allah will grant 73 rewards to ever who, whoever eliminates the, the cause of a Muslim sorrow or a believer's sadness. He will save 72 of those rewards for him, and he will grant him one reward immediately. Visiting our fellow Muslim believer has a lot of reward he, when he is healthy or in his last moments. Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, he says, anyone who visits his brother in faith for the sake of Allah, Allah will say, you have visited me, therefore your reward is upon me. And I will not be satisfied with less a reward for you than Jannah. And this reward, it starts, you know, not from the time you are sitting with that person. It starts from the time you make the intention, the niyyah to go visit that person. When you think in your mind and say, I want to go visit so-and-so. Imam, Imam Sadiq salam, said, whenever you start to go to visit your believing brother, Allah will forgive your sins. And he will fulfill your needs of this dunya and akhirah before you return. Subhanallah. So just even making the intention and starting to go. You are just starting to put on your shoe, for example. Or you grab your keys to your car. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, A friend cannot be considered a true friend unless he is tested on three different occasions. One is in the time of need. The second is behind your back. And the third is after your death. So after your death, what do we mean? We mean to remember them in our dua, say Fatiha for them, hold majlis for them, give sadaqah for them, read Quran for them, so on and so forth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he said, Ya Ali, Jibra'il wished to become a human being for seven reasons. One is Salatul Jama'ah. Second is companionship with scholars, ulama. Third, establishing peace between two people. The fourth is honoring the orphans. The fifth is visiting the sick. The sixth is attending a funeral procession, a janazah. Seventh is giving water to the pilgrims. And then he told Ali to be desirous of those things. Another way, you know, we can be there for uh, your brother is after his, you know, after his death is by attending his janazah, his funeral. There's such a high reward for attending the funeral prayer that even we see that Jibra'il wished to leave the heavens and come down to the earth and be like a human being and have all the struggles and strife that humans have to go through just so he could get the thawab of this action of joining the uh, attending the funeral procession imam bakr alayhi salam he said one who follows a funeral procession will be given four intercessions on the day of resurrection and whatever he says in dua for the deceased the angel will say the same will be for you so whatever we pray for them, we pray for Allah to forgive them, Allah will forgive you. We pray Jannah for them, Allah, the angel will say it will be for you. In another narration from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, the first gift that a believer is able to bestow on others after his death is that those who follow his funeral procession are forgiven. So this is a gift from the deceased towards those who attend his funeral. 
you know, losing a loved one is very is a very difficult time to go through. And we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the deceased and grant them the highest position in the Jannah. And we should ask Allah to give the family patience. There's much reward in this also to console the family members. We should always remember that life is very short and death will come to us unexpectedly. And we have to remember that we you know, all of us will be in that place in one day. When we look at the grave and we go to the funeral procession, we do the talqeen, we are shaking them and giving them their beliefs, telling them how to answer the angels. We have to remember that we will all be in that place at one time. And this will awaken us and humble us and make us uh, go towards the right path. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, 185, Every soul will taste death. And you will only be given your compensation on the day of resurrection. So he who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to the Jannah has attained his desire. And what is this life of this dunya except the enjoyment of delusion? So we should be like those people who are in an airport. We've all been in the airport with very little time to connect, you know, for our next flight and get to our proper destination. In that situation, we are looking frantic and we are only concerned about, you know, one thing, which is not to miss our flight. So we are looking this way, that way. We're not paying attention to anything else except how to get to our gate. You know, we should be concerned like this in a you know, similar way in regard to Akhara. How we know we should not get too distracted here and be concerned on how we should get, get to the gate of Jannah. We have another narration that says that we should be in this world like a traveler. A traveler is someone who knows that they're not going to be in that place that long and they are moving towards their next destination. So we have to keep in mind that we, you know, in the wa in the Raji'un, barely we are from Allah and we will return back to Allah. So we are not here forever. And we don't want to be idle, you know, thinking we have all the time in the world to start doing what we need to do and keep putting things off. We have to be careful not to miss our path to Jannah. We have to get our priorities in order before death sneaks up on us while we are unaware of it. We should be <clears throat> prepared for that moment as much as possible, inshallah. And we see that if one is prepared for death, then some some even will embrace the death when it comes to them, like Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his uh, noble companions alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam he says every breath that you take is a step towards your uh, towards death, and if man perceived his death and its speed towards him. He would certainly detest this world and everything in it, all of its hopes. He says one is seeking the dunya while death is seeking him. No one can escape the death. As we said, every soul will taste death, what Allah says. And uh, I want to use this story without saying it's authentic or not, but just for a akhlaqi point to give. Uh, because this story is in, found in Ahlul Sunnah uh, narrations. And uh, it says that a man from Bani Israel, he used to sit with Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam and attend his uh, gatherings. And during one of these sessions, <clears throat> the angel of death entered the gathering. Upon seeing the angel of death, the young man's face, it became pale, became like yellow, they say, because of fear. And he said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I'm afraid of this man. So order the wind to take me to the people of India. So Suleiman could control the wind. So Prophet Suleiman said, okay, I send you to India. <clears throat> Shortly afterward, the angel of death came to Prophet Suleiman, salam, and he was amazed. Prophet Suleiman asked the angel of death, why, was, why were you so amazed? The angel of death he replied that he he had been ordered to take the soul of this person while uh, he was there in Suleiman's company, but he his soul is to be taken in the land of India. 
you know, how can I take his soul? How can he get to India today? And I'm supposed to take his soul in India, but I find him here. So he is very shocked. So he continued to explain that he was surprised to find him in Prophet Suleiman's gathering, and he wants to take his soul there in India. So Suleiman explained that upon seeing the angel of death, the young man became very disturbed and he wanted the wind to carry him away to India. You know, the moral of this story is that we should all strive to prepare for the coming of the angel of death and be ready to welcome him instead of wanting to run away as far as we can, you know, and go all the way to India. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he gave his son Imam Hassan alayhi salam some advice. He said, oh my child, know that you have been created for the next world, not for this dunya, for destruction in this world, not for the lasting here, and for dying, not for living. You are in a place which doesn't belong to you, a house for making preparations and a passage towards the next world. You are being chased by death from which the one who runs away cannot escape, as it would surely overtake him. So be on your guard against it lest, it, lest it overtakes you at a time when you are in a sinful state and you are thinking of repenting. But it creates obstruction between you and repentance. In that case, you would ruin yourself. And we have to look at, you know, how we are living our lives and ask ourselves, are, you know, are we living a life that would, you know, we would be pleased with if the angel of death uh, came to us at any moment. You know, the thought of this alone is one of the biggest deterrent from committing sins. Because we can say, you know, are we, what if angel of death came to us in this moment? And uh, I remember that there was a brother, Muslim brother, in the prison in South Carolina. He was practicing Islam, yet, you know, all of a sudden he stopped. He stopped coming to Juma. He stopped coming to Salatul Jama'ah. He was in a different dorm, so we only saw him like in the kitchen in that time. Because at that time, we had a lot of us Muslim brothers had jobs in the kitchen. So when he came in, you know, uh, he he after you know he missed several weeks of Juma, and we noticed okay, brother's not there. So it, we approached him in the you know the cafeteria. And we asked him, you know, brother, you know, I don't know what's going on with you, but you should come back to Juma and where your family is, brothers, and you should return to the religion because he had stopped practicing the religion. And, you know, <clears throat> we told him that he should ask Allah for forgiveness, start praying again. And, you know, the night before, you know, this happened <clears throat> like the night before Juma or on the day of Juma in the morning, I don't remember. But it was very close to that time. And we went to Juma, but we didn't see him. Unfortunately, he wasn't there. He didn't take our advice. He stayed in the room. So after the Juma, we went back to the dorms. And we found out that during the daily check, because every two hours they put everyone in their room and they come around with the checkboard and make sure everyone is there. So during this count time, we call it, we found found out that uh, they found him he was dead in his bed because they make you stand up and uh at the count time and he didn't get up so they're banging on the door get up get up and then they found out that he died in his bed and you know we have many chances to do the right thing but oftentimes we ignore the call to do the good thing and you know we are not thinking that maybe that's our last chance that's our last call to do that good action to turn back to the forgiveness of Allah. And we would hate for Allah to take our soul while we are in a state of rebellion or disobedience. So we have to remember this when we're living out our daily life. So Imam Ali continues his advice to his son. He says, oh my child, <clears throat> remember death very much and uh, the place where you have to go suddenly and will reach after death. So that when it comes to you, you are already on your guard against it and you have prepared yourself for it. And it doesn't come to you all of a sudden and surprise you. It's narrated from one of the Ansar. They asked uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, He said, how come I don't like death? 
Rasulullah asked him, do you have some money? Do you have, you know, wealth? He said, yes. Then Rasulullah said, then send your wealth to the hereafter. Send it ahead of yourself. One is always attached to his wealth. If he sends it ahead of himself, then he likes to join it. But if he keeps it in this dunya, he will always want to stay in this dunya. So one of the, you know, prescriptions that we can say for, you know, uh, attaining the hereafter and not having hubb dunya or love of this world is if we have money, we should spend it in the cause of Allah. Spend it in sadaqah. And you will see the uh, reward of that action in the hereafter. And you know that it is there waiting for you multiplied in times. So we would want to go to that place to get all of our investments. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he said, what is death except a bridge that you traverse from trials and hardships unto the wide spacious gardens and continuous bounties? Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, death is like a bridge. You are crossing from one place to the next place. He said, would any of you hate that you would be changed from a prison into a palace? And what is for your enemies except that it will be for them changing from a palace into a prison and punishment? Verily, my father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, told me from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that he said, Verily, this world is a prison for the believer and it is a paradise for the disbeliever. So we have to remember <clears throat> this, you know, that we are here. And we are just crawl, waiting to cross that bridge. This place is like a prison. And we are going to the paradise, which is a palace for us. While the disbeliever, they want to stay here because this is their Jannah. And they don't look at anything on the other side. So for them, you know, uh, it, you know, uh, they are going somewhere where they will meet punishment. And we have to remember our loved ones who passed away, all the believers who passed away, before us and we ask forgiveness for them. Uh, there's a narration by Sheikh Al-Kumi that during the last moments of his life, Salman Al-Muhammadi or Salman Al-Farsi went to the graveyard and he spoke to a dead person. Salman's awliya Allah. Allah has given him many abilities due to his taqwa. So the dead person was narrating what happened to him after his death. He said, when they finished praying on me, Salatul Mayyat, I was carried to my grave and put inside of it. I faced a great fear. O oh, Salman, know well that when I was put down from the coffin to the grave, it was very scary. This is why we see when we do Janazah, <clears throat> we don't put the person directly in the grave. For the man, we are carrying them and we set them down a little bit and wait. Then we pick them up, put them down a second time. Then we pick them up and we put them down a third time. And then the fourth time we are putting them in the grave. <clears throat> As for women, we are putting them down two times. And the third time we are putting them in the grave. I don't know the reason behind this, but you know, maybe the women are much braver than us. So <laughs> we are setting them down twice. But the main thing is that we see that <clears throat> getting put in that grave it's a scary situation for the person who is deceased. It's the most difficult moment. And, uh, you know, the feeling of uh, falling down, you know, is very terrifying. You know, imagine if one of us falls from the uh, fifth floor of a building, for example, to the ground. What is the feeling like when he is falling? It's, it's scary. So he says, when I was put down inside the grave, I felt that I fell from the sky to the ground inside my grave, subhanAllah. Then my grave was sealed with bricks and covered with earth. After the caller called everyone to leave, everyone leaves the person in the grave. You know, till how long will they stay there next to that person's grave? The closest one to them, maybe they stay for a few minutes and then they leave, as Quran says, and you have certainly come to us alone as we have created you the first time. This is Surah An'am, Ayat 94. The narration continues. He says, after the caller called everyone to leave, I started having regrets. 
and I cried because of this grave's narrowness and pressure. I said, I wish I could come back. I wish I was with those who came back from my funeral. If I would come back, I would do good deeds. As I said that to myself, I heard a voice from the grave answering me, saying, No, it is but a word that he speaks, and behind them there is a barrier until the day they are resurrected. It's Surah Mu'minun, Ayat 100. I said, Who is it that speaks to me reading this verse? He answered, saying, I am the angel which Allah has authorized over all of his creatures to make them write their own deeds. It's us that will write our own book of deeds. On the, and on the date of judgment, we will bring that book with confessions in it of what we have done. He said, then he pulled me and made me sit down and he told me, write your deeds. How many volumes is this? You know, like how many, how many volumes do we have to write to write all of our deeds? 90 million, 100 million volumes, more than that. What is important is that, you know, we know that he has to write all of his deeds. He told him, I can't even count all of my deeds. You know, I don't remember everything. He it says, the angel answered him saying, haven't you heard your Lord's words? Allah has kept count of it and they have forgotten it. This is uh, Surah Mujaddala, Ayat 6. Then he told me, write and I will dictate to you what you did. Then he dictated to me everything I have done in this dunya until there was nothing left of my deeds, big or small. He dictated everything to me. It's a very difficult situation. There's another riwayat, and I'll say part of it. He says, and he writes the good deeds which he has done in this life until he reaches his bad deeds. Then when he reaches his bad deeds, he feels ashamed to write those bad deeds that he did in this dunya. This gaze at a woman that's forbidden to him, you know, how can he write it? The lie that he told, how can he write it? The backbiting that he did, the injustice that he did, even if it was, you know, injustice to his own kids. And the angel says, oh, sinner, now you are ashamed. Weren't you ashamed from your creator when you were doing these things in this life? You know, if a child watches us, we wouldn't commit some actions. We are ashamed in front of a child to do these bad things. Yet we're not ashamed to do them in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be said, you were not ashamed before Allah, and now you are ashamed before me. Right. This issue of feeling ashamed before Allah and before the angels and before the, all those people who see, you know, sometimes a person wishes that the ground would just split open and swallow him. So he doesn't have to face those situation of other people knowing all of the bad things that he did in this dunya. Ya Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, uh, remember death repeatedly. This will save you from longing for the dunya. And Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, he said, O people, fear Allah and know that you will inevitably return to him when everyone will see his good and bad deeds right before his very eyes. He will wish for the longest period of time to separate him from his bad deeds. Allah warns you about himself. He says, Woe to you, O son of Adam. You are negligent, but not neglected. Your death is rushing towards you. It is approaching you with sure steps. It is targeting at you and is about to hit you, and it will soon take your age in full. The angel of death seizes your soul, and you will be alone in your grave. There your soul will be given back to you, and the two angels, Munkar and Nakir, will break into your grave and examine and interrogate you so difficultly. First of all, they will ask you about your Lord, who you are worshiping, the prophet who was sent to you, the religion that you are following, the book that you are taking as a guide, the imam who you are uh, following. They will ask you, as, uh, how have you spent your years, the source of your wealth, and the ways in which you spent your money? Be cautious, look upon yourself, and prepare answers for the test, examination, interrogation, and interrogations. Is advice from Imam Sajjad for us. And you know, when we are we are preparing ourselves in this life for our exams and all of these things, you know, when we are in school, 
or in our jobs trying to get promotions. We are studying and preparing for these tests and staying up all night, taking the notes and flashcards and all of these things. But what about preparing ourselves for the biggest test of all, which is in our grave? And Allah says in Surah Tumuk, Ayat 2, He who created death and life to test you as to which is best indeed, he is exalted in might and the most forgiving. So our belief and actions will be tested. So we should strive to work on them to the best of our abilities by learning and implementing the teachings of those that Allah sent to guide us, which is uh, Muhammad and Ali Muhammad alayhi He said, you know, if you are faithful, Imam continues, he says, if you are faithful, knowledgeable of your religion, loyal to the truthful, and following Allah's uh, disciples, Allah will prompt you to provide an acceptable confirmation and will make you speak accurately so that you say the correct answer. Because one is so scared in that moment when the angels come to them, maybe they don't know what to say. But Allah will prompt them with this, uh, what to say, if they were doing good in this world. And you will be foretold of gaining paradise and Allah's consent, and the angels will receive you with comfort and happiness. However, if you are not, your tongue will stammer, you will stutter, and your proof will be rejected, and you will not be able to answer. Hell will be advanced towards you, and the angels will receive you with anguish, anguish of the dwelling of boiling water and the heat of Jahannam. So Imam is telling us how to be successful in the grave. You know, there was uh, one time a young man was on his deathbed when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came and sat near him. He said, recite Shahadatain. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But he couldn't. Rasulullah asked if his mother was there. A woman sitting near his head said, yes, I'm his mother. Rasulullah said, are you, you know, displeased with your son? She, uh, she said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. We haven't spoken to each other for the last six years. Rasulullah asked this woman to forgive her son. And at the Prophet's insistence, she forgave him the mistakes that he did, and they were reconciled. At once, the young man was able to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, what do you see at this moment? O Prophet of Allah, I see a dark and smelly man who has got a hold of me and he is not leaving me. Rasulullah told him to recite uh, a dua that he gave him. And then he did and he said, now what do you see? He said, I see a man handsome and fragrant and he's coming towards me. Rasulullah said, keep saying this dua. When the youth repeated this dua, he said, Ya Rasulullah, both of them have disappeared away from me. After this, the face of the Prophet it says it was illuminated with joy. And he said, O oh Allah, forgive the sins of this young man. And then the youth, he passed away in this moment. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said, if you could only see what happens during and after death, you would give up hope for everything in this dunya and all its attractions. <clears throat> so we should want to stay in this dunya in order to use it as a place to earn rewards for the life to come. And we should always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a good ending. Because this is the you know very important, important to have a good ending. You know, how many people have we seen in history who started out good but ended badly? For example, Shimr used to be a Quran reciter. He used to be a companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen. But later on, he beheaded Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. And how many have we seen who started out bad but ended up good? For example, Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, who captured Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, and his family and held them in Karbala. Yet in the end, he repented and he joined the Imam and defended him until his last breath. Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam, she said in her dua, Ya Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over creation, keep me alive so long as you know that life is good for me and cause me to die when death is good for me. We have to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to have a good ending. You know, not everyone uh, may have a, a good ending. We have to continue to ask Allah, you know, to plant our feet firm in this uh, path of Islam. <clears throat> so I think we uh, can end here um, and continue, inshallah, because I think we have run out of time now. It's been 30 minutes.